When Final Fantasy VII originally launched on the PlayStation back in 1997, to say that it set the gaming world on fire would be an understatement. It was acclaimed by critics as one of the best games of not only that year, but of all time, and players around the world were taken in by the massive narrative and technical leaps forward that Final Fantasy VII represented for the role-playing genre at the time. Packed with mind-blowing 3D battles, huge summon effects, and an intense and dark story that spanned three whole CD-ROMs, the world the development team had created cast a formidable shadow over the genre that would loom large for many years to come. Central to this was, of course, the characters and the many set-piece moments they featured in, but there was one that stood out above all the rest. It focused on Aerith Gainsborough, and it has become the single most famous event in the entirety of the franchise due to its severity and finality. Ever since the early days of the franchise, there had always been a notion of losing characters along the way. The developers felt it was important that these games dealt with serious subject matters, but at the time, this was made quite simple due to the graphical style they adopted. As the 8-bit and 16-bit eras developed, this saw numerous characters perish, with prominent examples being Josef and Galuf. But to keep players guessing, some characters who players felt had been lost would even end up coming back. Partway through development of Final Fantasy VII, the decision was taken that someone from the playable cast should die. In the initial sense, this was going to be quite extreme, as Yoshinori Kitase wanted to kill the majority of the cast as part of the final mission, in not too dissimilar fashion to Mass Effect 2's suicide mission. But this idea was vetoed, and the team collectively decided that they should focus this storytelling mechanic on just one character. After much debate, the decision was taken that the sacrificed character should be Aerith Gainsborough, and due to the way the scene was handled, it has been immortalised as one of the most impactful scenes to ever feature in a video game. In part, this was because of the masterful way that the scenario team endeared Aerith to the player, giving her a rich and relatable backstory, while also injecting her with enough charm and charisma to make her an instant fan favourite, and the more real Aerith felt, the more potential there was for her death to impact audiences and impact audiences it did. At the time, heartbroken players scoured whatever resources were available to see if there was a way to revive her, with some methods of bringing Aerith back to life even becoming infamous schoolyard rumours and viral April Fool's jokes. Enterprising players with cheat devices, and later also through the use of mods, found that it was possible to bring Aerith back to the party for gameplay purposes, but outside of this, there never has been an official canon way to prevent her death or revive her. Which of course begs the question, what if Aerith didn't die? There would, of course, be gameplay implications, but what would her survival mean for the story of Final Fantasy VII, especially since so much of the game's emotional and narrative weight hinged on this pivotal moment? It's an intriguing question, so within this video, we're going to take a deep dive into this very topic, to understand what it would mean for the story of Final Fantasy VII, and the wider compilation of Final Fantasy VII, if Aerith didn't meet her end in the City of the Ancients. Paradoxically, however, to answer the question of what might have happened if Aerith didn't die, we first need to start by explaining why she absolutely had to. Once it had been decided by the narrative team that Aerith should be the sacrificial lamb, a plausible and logical reason for this scenario to occur had to be created. And central to this was the game's wider themes of death and the acceptance of death. It meant that when the moment came, it had to be crucial from an in-game lore perspective. Put simply, Aerith's death needed to be seen as an essential piece of the puzzle, and it had to be something that came as a complete shock. To work alongside this, Sephiroth was used in a sparse but effective manner. This meant that by the time the party had caught up to Aerith in the City of the Ancients, it had already been made clear that Sephiroth was capable of being wherever he needed to be at any given time through the use of Genova. Appearing seemingly at will at the Shinra headquarters, the mountain pass to the Mithril Caves, and even on the ship bound for Costa del Sol, his omnipresence was palpable and terrifying. In addition to this, by manipulating Cloud in the Temple of the Ancients, Sephiroth had already obtained the Black Materia, which he needed in order to summon Meteor. This meant the end of the world was nigh, 
but it still felt like there was a degree of control. The odds had been stacked against many protagonists before, and they'd always found a way. That's what made the death of Aerith, and the subsequent casting of Meteor, so chilling. This chain of events served as the literal manifestation of beating someone when they were already down. Sephiroth was already in the ascendancy. It seemed as though he'd all but won, and the death of Aerith was a painful act, not least because unlike some previous games, there was no ready-made replacement waiting in the wings. It also served as a prominent event that, when combined with the surrounding circumstances, tipped everything over the edge, both in-game and for many players, Cloud acted as the manifestation of this, as the world descended into chaos and it seemed like there was no hope. What players did not know at the time though, was that Aerith had orchestrated these events. Aerith knew that Holy was the only chance the planet had at surviving Meteor should Sephiroth use the Black Materia. She also knew that any attempt to use Holy would attract Sephiroth and Genova in an attempt to stop her. After all, Sephiroth was well versed in the Ancients and their magic. This was, in part, due to his extensive research into the notes of Professor Hojo and Professor Garst, and the knowledge he gleaned from the Temple of the Ancients, but Sephiroth had also learnt much from his time inside the livestream. While it's unclear how far in advance Aerith had planned to use Holy, and it's very possible that she'd hoped the party would succeed in their mission to save the planet without requiring its use. By the time Sephiroth had proven he could manipulate Cloud to do his bidding, and had obtained the Black Materia, it stands to reason that she had accepted there was no other way. Coming to Cloud in a dream sequence prior to leaving the City of the Ancients, it was implied that she had long accepted the risks associated with using the White Materia, and had made up her mind to use it, no matter the cost, in a bid to save the planet. When Cloud caught up with her praying in the City of the Ancients, Sephiroth again attempted to manipulate Cloud, this time trying to force him to kill her in his stead. Failing at this due to a combination of the efforts of Cloud's friends and his own resistance, Sephiroth then proceeded to take matters into his own hands. Though Sephiroth was successful in killing Aerith, he was too late to stop her from casting Holy. What's more, by killing her, and unbeknownst to him at the time, Sephiroth had unintentionally made Aerith an even bigger threat than she had been previously. Similar to Obi-Wan Kenobi in Star Wars Episode 4, A New Hope, Striking Aerith down had made her more powerful than Sephiroth could have ever imagined. In her corporeal form, Aerith was powerful, but there were limits to her power. But after being struck down by Sephiroth, Aerith fell into the life stream of the planet, and by avoiding dissolution, she became cognizant to the will of the planet and how to harness some of its more extreme powers. It's unclear as to whether or not Aerith explicitly knew this would happen, what is known though, is that as part of the livestream, it would become harder for Sephiroth to stop her in the future, and this soon became important in a big way. Killing Aerith lured Sephiroth into a false sense of security, as he thought he had dealt with the immediate threat she posed to his big ambitions. That being said, he also knew that Holy had been cast, and it took a great deal of effort for him to keep its power at bay. And this is where Aerith's death paid off, and was crucial. Later, after attempting to destroy Meteor on their own after it had been summoned by Sephiroth, Cloud and his allies soon realised that Holy was their main line of defence. However, they also realised that its power was being blocked by Sephiroth. This saw them pivot. They would focus their efforts on weakening Sephiroth's gaze so that Aerith's plan could play out. As a villain, Sephiroth was very powerful, and was very aware of how powerful he was. His key flaw though, was his hubris about this fact, which resulted in a consistent underestimation of others and an occasional lack of situational awareness due to overconfidence. With Cloud and the party concentrating their efforts on Sephiroth alone, and then defeating him, his suppression of Holy faltered and allowed the spell to begin to counteract Meteor. Colliding over Midgar, for a moment it seemed like the party's efforts came too late, as Holy struggled to ward off the end of the world, and Midgar was collapsing under the weight of this cosmic threat. That was, until Aerith rallied the power of the livestream. As Aerith possessed immense willpower as an ancient, and was therefore a natural adept at using this art of magic, she was able to maintain her sense of self in the livestream, even in death. From this state, she was able to use her will to influence world events on a massive scale and using the immense magical energy stored in the livestream, she bolstered Holy's efforts and destroyed Meteor once and for all, putting an end to Sephiroth's apocalyptic plans. 
By providing a second front in the war against Sephiroth, and therefore dividing his attention and power, Aerith was able to ensure the safety of the planet, something that would have not been possible had she still been alive. Therefore, though it pains us to say it, Aerith had to die in order for the meteor to be stopped. But what would have happened if Aerith had lived? Long story short, it's more plausible that Sephiroth would have won. And this goes beyond just the simple viewpoint of Aerith not being there to support Holy via the livestream in the same manner. Had Aerith survived, the probability of Cloud suffering a complete mental breakdown decreases. She would have no doubt tried to support Cloud, as was evidenced numerous times, attempting to understand and help him come to terms with what had happened. But without Cloud's mind breaking, and then the need to rebuild it inside the livestream with assistance from Tifa, they would have not been prepared to tackle Sephiroth head on. As revealed in the novella, The Girl Who Travels the Planet, a debatably canonical story which documented Aerith's existence in the livestream after her death, Aerith played a key role in helping to rebuild Cloud's mind when Cloud and Tifa fell in the livestream in Medeal. By protecting them from Mako poisoning and guiding Tifa to Cloud's soul, Aerith was able to not just help her friends survive this traumatic event, but also fix Cloud's memory and give him a newfound sense of purpose. Had Aerith still been alive, this may not have been possible, and such a scenario would have played right into Sephiroth's hands. In this scenario, a playable party would have had two courses of action available to them, attempting to destroy the Meteor themselves, or relying on the power of Holy to either hold back or defeat Meteor. Once the former failed, as happened in the scenario where Aerith died, they would have had to rely on the power of Holy, and they would have come to the same conclusion, Sephiroth would need to be distracted or defeated to nullify his suppression of Holy. However, they would be required to face off against Sephiroth with a leader and powerful ally who was then unreliable and could still be manipulated. They would have had Aerith as an additional ally during this conflict and her healing abilities would have been useful. But as seen numerous times, the influence and power of Aerith over Cloud was much less effective than that of Sephiroth. And had Cloud been rendered useless, or even turned against his friends, that would have hindered their chances of success and made victory nigh impossible to achieve. That's not to minimise the emotional impact of Aerith's sacrifice or take too pragmatic an approach on how her death was handled, but it's difficult to see a scenario where Aerith lives and Sephiroth doesn't win out as the victor and achieve his goals. With regards to how specific moment-to-moment -moment scenes in the original Final Fantasy VII would have played out following Aerith's death, if she were still alive, there isn't an official way of knowing, and anything that could be said would be nothing more than pure speculation. But this fact hasn't stopped some intrepid and ambitious fans from coming up with their own versions of how things would have played out if everyone's favourite flower girl hadn't met her end. And if one was to go down that route, they'd be remiss not to mention the most popular take on this idea, which comes via a fan mod called Final Fantasy VII New Threat. New Threat was made by Stuart Melville, who goes by the modding handle Sega Chief. As most mods do, New Threat features a bevy of changes to Final Fantasy VII's overall experience, including new enemies and some general balancing to the gameplay. More than this though, it offers players the chance to change history and save Aerith from Sephiroth's wrath. To do this, New Threat gives players two different flavours of gameplay. Route A, which has all the benefits of the mod, but fewer new story elements, and Route B, which features a multitude of reimagined moments. Regardless of which route is taken by the player, however, to revive Aerith, players have to contend with a reimagined Genova life battle, in which their actions determine if she lives or not. If successful, Aerith remains present for the rest of the playthrough, which leads to some very interesting interpretations of key events. In Route A, saving Aerith does not substantially change the narrative of the game from its original version, but it does add a bunch of Aerith-specific dialogue rewrites to iconic scenes, such as when the party reflects on her death in Cosmo Canyon. While these changes allow for some new and touching moments to those intimately familiar with the plot, including one where Cloud and Aerith discuss Zack's death together, there are no drastic changes to how the game's story concludes. This makes its speculation on what would have happened had Aerith lived more of an exploration in how her character would have reacted to parts of the story where she was sadly absent. For what it's worth though, New Threat is a fascinating concept, as proved by its popularity, and it's a great experience for returning fans who want a little challenge added and some new surprises, even if it's a very unofficial stance on an alternate continuity where Aerith lived. 
In terms of the official story of Final Fantasy VII though, and its compilation continuity, Aerith's death was an essential part of the plot, and it's what made it so special and impactful on multiple levels. The scenario writers picked the perfect character and the perfect moment to tie everything together. It stunned players and in-game characters on an emotional level, but after they came to terms with what had happened and accepted that Aerith wasn't coming back, they were able to appreciate that her sacrifice was the one thing that enabled them to defeat Sephiroth and save the planet from utter destruction. But what do you all think? Do you feel that Sephiroth could have still been defeated even without Aerith's sacrifice? Let us know in the comments below because we'd love to hear your own theories and thoughts on the topic. With that though, thanks for watching the video and if you enjoyed the concept, feel free to hit that like button and subscribe for more content. Alright everyone, with that, this is Daryl signing out. As always, I'd like to give a big thank you to all of our Patreon and YouTube membership supporters, especially Benjamin Snow, The Livestream, Gregory, Justin Dent, and Sukun TDK, who are super special Onion Eye supporters. And of course, a big thank you to everyone for watching this video. I'll see you all again soon for more Final Fantasy goodness.